I have to rate the cavern's blow one star. So you've probably given up like four or five quality turns trying to pull off what I think is ultimately a gimmick effect. An awkward quest to play, complete, and then the payoff is just okay. It feels pretty helpless when you play against it and you're playing anything but one of those aggressive decks. And this goes to show, I think, like, it's, I think this is a very good example of why a lot of players have been saying Quest Rogue is just the best. Because even... Uh, I wonder why they're nerfing that card. Wow! wow. And you see Roger's reaction to it as well. Wow! That, that is, is insane! A, that's a huge draw. And I don't that think... That is insane! Unless Roger has, like, a, like a tidal wave or, like, a meteor strike his side of the stage right now, there is no way he's losing this one. That is nuts. Back in 2017, Hearthstone released Journey to Angoro, one of the most widely beloved expansions of all time. One of the new features brought in the expansion was the Quest Keyword, a series of legendary spells that would always appear in your opening hand. The quest would have a task that you would need to complete, such as discarding six cards, and then you would receive a powerful reward worth the hoops you had to jump through. These quests were all levels of playable, from the terrible Lakari Sacrifice to the twice nerfed Caverns Below. Despite being undervalued in early reviews and being one of the worst rated cards in the whole set behind cards like Ozrook and like Adaptation, the Caverns Below immediately burst onto the scene being taken to rank number one legend by Dog Dog. The Caverns Below is a one mana legendary quest that requires you to play four minions with the same name. As a reward, you receive Crystal Core, which is a 5 mana spell that makes all your minions 5 5 for the rest of the game as an aura. This is a bit of a strange effect, but basically it means that all minions you summon get their quote unquote base stats changed to 5 5. You can still use cards like Equality to change them into 1 1, but if you use a card like Polymorph to transform a minion, the resulting sheep will now be a 5 5. Now how do you play 4 minions with the same name when you can only include 2 minions with the same name when building your deck? Well the answer is bouncy effects like Shadow Step, a 0 mana spell that returns a friendly minion to your hand and makes it cost 2 less, and the only seen when things get really weird, Youthful Brewmaster, as well as the newly released Gadgets and Ferryman to give the deck a critical mass of self bounce effects. You combine these cards with cheap minions like Swash Burglar or Novice Engineer to keep your hand full and progress the quest. Once you have gotten Crystal Core, you hope to have pre nerf preparation in your hand to reduce its cost by 3 and make all the little 1 mana minions in your deck 5-5s five that overwhelm your opponent. As a bonus, previously tiny cards like Patches, South Sea Deckhand, and Stone Tusk Boar are now 1 mana 5-5 five five charges that can put an immense amount of pressure on your opponent. While the setup for this quest, like other quests, requires essentially passing on your first turn and losing tempo by putting minions from your field into your hand made the deck weaker to very aggressive deck, any mid-range or slower decks would get blown out by the massive value of cheap, big-bodied minions the deck would produce. Now that the core tenets of the deck had been established, it was time to improve and iterate. In the lead-up to Dreamhack Austin, players realized they needed more survivability to handle the onslaught of aggro decks like Token Druid, Pirate Warrior, and Aggro Paladin, as well as a little more gas to keep the deck going. Firefly, one of the beloved cards of the expansion, began to see play in the deck and slot in very well, as it did everything the deck was looking for. It was a cheap card that could be bounced with Shadow Step and Brewmaster effects, and it put minions in your hand that would become 1 mana 5-5s five as soon as Crystal Core was played. In addition, the Flame Elementals generated by this card were the same as those generated by Igneous Elemental, so without any self-bouncy effects, you could complete the quest with just these. Another all-star of Anguro, Glacial Shard, also started seeing play as a great battle cry that could put the freeze on aggressive strategies your opponent was trying to cook up. In addition, cards like Backstab could stave off Murloc Tidecallers and with the help of Rogue's Hero Power could take out relevant 3 health minions like South Sea Captain or Dread Corsair. Now for the yuckier part, figuring out a way to draw cards. While Novice Engineer is nice, you need a lot more card draw for a deck like this especially since most of your cards get used up as self bounce effects. People were desperate for draw and were split on whether to include 2 Fan of Knives or 2 Mimic Pods. Fan of Knives provides a little bit of an answer for dealing with the ever-present patches of the time, and cleaning up cards like Biolf and Tidehunter. However, you are only drawing one card for 3 mana, meaning you might not be able to get to your combo pieces fast enough. Mimic Pod didn't have the defensive utilities of Fan of Knives, but allowed for potential high rolls by getting an extra Shadow Step or Glacial Shard. 
Now you have to remember all these cards were better during this time period due to preparation discounting your next spell by 3 at the time, which was, I mean, woof. In addition, Rogue also had access to one of, in my opinion, the crazier cards ever printed in Vanish. Vanish is a 6 mana Rogue spell that returns all minions to their owner's hands. So not only is this a massively useful tool for Rogue, whose main issue is dealing with a lot of minions at once, it also bounces your own minions back to your hand for even further repetition of battle cries. At Dreamhack Austin 2017, we see 4 of the top 8 bring Caverns Below Rogue with some new developments to the deck. Two of Firefly and Glacial Shard now become standard as Fan of Knives falls out of popularity in favor of Mimic Pod or Igneous Elementals. For a more direct counter to all the Murlocs running around the meta at the time, players begin bringing two Hungry Crabs, which is a 1 mana 1 2 beast that has the battle cry to destroy a Murloc to gain plus 2 plus 2. A very weak card under normal circumstances, in a Murloc heavy climate, the card becomes 1 mana to get a Spider Tank and remove an enemy minion of your choice probably a 5 or 6 mana value for only one makes it a very powerful tech card. The first place list by Shoop has some of the most goo I've seen in any deck list. The deck runs 2 Biofin Hunter as a taunt and a 2 mana 10-10 after quest completion, as well as, shockingly, 2 of Wisp. One of Hearthstone's classic cards, Wisp had never really seemed worth the card slot in your deck, but when you just need a card to play over and over, 0 mana is pretty good. And the stats for the cost, it blows up your calculator. In the $200,000 China vs EU NetEase tournament of 2017, we see 5 of the top 8 lineups including Quest Rogue and using some of the new developments made from Dreamhack like 2x, Bialf, and Tidehunter being more common, and we begin to see new changes to the deck like forgoing some of the removal like Backstab and Eviscerate altogether and putting in cards to pay off all the elementals in the deck like playing Tolvir Stone Shaper to provide a pretty resilient taunt to a typically very vulnerable deck. However, dogs different from dogs, second place list didn't include the card. In the Hearthstone Spring Championships of 2017, we see a ton of players bring the deck, with 11 of the 16 players bringing Rogue and every single one being Quest Rogue, and the deck being the most frequently banned deck of the tournament, including being banned by Kalento in the finals and Hoye winning. With this, builds of the deck had mostly settled, with the main difference being if you were running Tolvir Stone Shaper or not, and maybe sometimes you'd see a cheeky Doomsayer as an early game equalizer. But now, it was time to say goodbye to Quest Rogue. It had just been hit with a nerf, from requiring 4 minions with the same name, to 5. Now becoming much more difficult to complete, and being even more open to aggro, the deck plummeted from middle of tier 1 on Tempo Storm Meta Snapshot to tier 4. Then Knights of the Frozen Throne released, changing up the whole meta, and the deck fell to tier 5. During this time, the deck couldn't keep up with Frozen Throne staples of Jade Druid, Highlander Priest, and Tempo Rogue, a rogue deck that would forego the quest entirely and instead build around the new Prince Kalisap card released in Knights of the Frozen Throne, along with the other Tempo staples of the time like Bone Mare. The deck also used cards typically excluded from Quest Rogue like Leroy Jenkins in order to close out games. The only real benefit Quest Rogue strategies got were sometimes including the Valera Death Knight as a top-end defensive option. After spending all of Frozen Throne on ice, there were calls of ripped Quest Rogue sung out by the masses. But then, once Cobalt and Catacombs released, we saw the deck sneak its way back into the meta at Tier 3. Cobalt and Catacombs ushered in a much slower meta with the insane tools given to Warlock and what would become the face of the set in Carnivorous Cube. Cobalt and Catacombs also provided Quest Rogue with a number of new cards to boost its strategy. These cards were Sonya Shadow Dancer, Elven Minstrel, and Zola the Gorgon. Sonya is a 3 mana 2 2 minion with the on field effect that after a friendly minion dies, add a 1 1 copy to your hand that costs 1. Along with cheap minions that could attack immediately, like Patches of Pirate and Stone Tusk 4, Sonya could be used to remove minions on your opponent's board while also single handedly completing your quest requirements. This card fit in the deck very smoothly with what the deck was already looking for. Next was Elven Minstrel, one of the best consistency cards and draw cards the game has seen. By activating the combo keyword, as in playing another card before it during your turn, which is very easy to do with the zero cost cards like Backstab or Preparation, you could draw two minions from your deck. Finally, the deck didn't have to rely on Shadow Stepping Novice Engineer or giving your opponent free cards with Cold Light Oracle. On top of that, you were getting a Bloodfen Raptor for your troubles. The third critical card the deck received was Zola the Gorgon. This is a 3 mana 2 2 legendary that adds a golden copy of one of your minions to your hand. While you are paying one more mana for Zola than you would with Youthful Brewmaster, you aren't shooting yourself in the foot as much by removing cards from your field. 
There were also a smattering of new cards that saw experimentation like Wax Elemental as a defensive tool that would require at least two attacks to get rid of and an awesome card to have buffed to 5-5. Five five. Feral Gibberer even saw some experimentation as a cheap card to potentially keep your hand full. While the deck had positive matchups on the slower decks of the format such as Q-Block, decks like Aggro Palatin fueled by the broken Divine Favor and pre-nerf Corridor Creeper were able to stomp on the deck with its ability to quickly develop bodies and completely refill the hand with Divine Favor. By now, the slime of Quest Road had resurfaced as a highly polarized Tier 2 deck who existed as an option among highly skilled players at Top Legend. It also attracted some attention in this Vicious Syndicate article that suggested it could emerge as a counter to what was becoming an oppressive Ravza plus Kazakus plus Shadow Reaper Anduin or Razakus Priest deck that provided excellent control tools as well as an inevitability in its Raza plus Anduin combo. The deck then began including copies of Bluegill Warrior to serve as yet another charger for the deck but the entire meta was about to be shaken to its core. Patch 10.2.0.23180 brought about four balance changes that would tear the meta asunder. Two contenders for strongest cards of all time were altered in this patch including Corridor Creeper going from a 5-5 to a 2-5 dealing a harsh blow to aggressive, token-based decks as well as most decks in general with how strong the card was previously. Patches of Pirate, one of the defining cards of this era of Hearthstone lost its charge and had its voice line changed. Still, an incredibly potent card for its ability to get a free 1-1 on the board, Dex lost face damage or an efficient minion for trading into your opponents. A staple in Quest Rogue since the beginning, this had perhaps the most direct effect on the deck. A nerf that had a domino effect on Quest Rogue was Ross of the Change, reducing the cost of your hero power to 1 rather than 0. Rizarka's Priest now became much weaker without access to the free 2 damage, and most likely more, of board removal each turn and a more difficult OTK combo. With the popular deck that Quest Rogue would feed on now being weaker and falling out of popularity, so too would Quest Rogue. And finally, the staple Bone Mare had been nerfed to 8 mana. Not a massive nerf, but a notable one for how much the card had cropped up. Following this, the deck fell into relative tier 3, tier 4, and tier 5 obscurity, only being relevant in the tournament scene, but with every new expansion, more coal was placed into the furnace of the deck's ambition. With the release of the Witchwood, Quest Rogue explodes onto the scene as a tier 2 deck and the highest it had been since its heyday before the quest requirement was nerfed to 5 minions. The only new card the deck included was Vicious Scalehide, a 2 mana 1 3 beast with lifesteal and rush that would become a massive stabilization tool once it became a 5 5 due to the quest. The biggest focal point of the Witchwood meta were these two, Gen Greymane and Baku the Moon Eater. The meta more or less warped around these two as their effects would be seen every game since they happened at the start of the game. By having your deck full of only even cost or odd cost cards, your hero power would either cost 1 or become upgraded respectively. While one might at first assume restricting yourself to half the card pool would be too steep a price, it turns out Paladin always having access to a 1 mana silver hand recruit was more than worth it for running a Mani Berserker in your deck. But with that said, with all the Paladins running around clicking hero power all the time, there were now a ton of 1-1s one running around that meant bringing back the old classic, Fan of Knives. Slow Warlock decks continued to grow in popularity and now the deck had become tier 1 in the eyes of Tempo Storm. And just in time for the Hearthstone Champions Tour again beginning in Europe where 20 of the 73 competitors brought Quest Rogue with Group A winner Turna bringing the deck. However, in spite of so many players bringing the deck, there was a definite lack of the goo, the sauce, that was seen before with players randomly including Morose or Wisp. Occasionally, players would bring Acidic Swamp Ooze, maybe sometimes throw in one sap, maybe debate on one or two Fan of Knives, but the deck had become mostly fleshed out with one new Witchwood card, Vicious Scalehide. The most interesting part of this tour was the re-emergence of Igneous Elemental that capitalized on the popularity of slower decks and the falling out of favor of Spellbreaker. The most interesting effect the deck was having on the standard ladder, on the other hand, was its chilling effect it had on control decks like Control Warlock, Q-Block, or control priest. While the deck would get blasted apart by aggressive mage lists, the fear of running into the caverns below and the speed at which players would switch into it when the meta would slow down caused attention on the ladder. With all this discontent surrounding the deck, it was time to nerf it. Again. Patch 11.1.1.24589 provides more massive changes to the game. Most notably for us, Crystal Core, the reward for completing the caverns below, now making the minions 4-4 instead of 5-5. A nerf that doesn't completely destroy the deck, but does knock it down a couple of tiers from tier 1, the deck still has a favorable matchup against very slow decks, but the lack of power against mid-range decks is noticed. However, these changes were not in a vacuum. 
Call to Arms, another one of those strongest cards ever made, gets nerfed from 4 mana to 5, now excluding it from even Paladin lists, and Spiteful Summoner, now gets put up to 7 mana, pushing back the massive turn from Spiteful Druid. And just like the last time it was nerfed, a new rogue deck took its place. This time, a deck built around Gadgetan Auctioneer and Feldora Ice Strider, along with classic finisher Leroy Jenkins, that had the room to run some of Rogue's stronger tools like Vile Spine Slayer. And just like that, the caverns below Rogue slithered away, back to whichever caverns it came from, never to be seen again. Except, and stop me if you heard this one before, it was time for a new expansion to come out and Quest Rogue got the one card it needed to come back. This time, that card was Giggling Inventor, a bizarre card in the history of Hearthstone. Giggling Inventor was a 5 mana 2 1 and summoned 2 Anoyotrons on summon. The new meta warping card, the card looks fairly innocuous at first. I remember when I was first learning about Hearthstone and I heard war stories about how strong Giggling Inventor was, and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's just a 5 mana 4 5 though. Isn't that bad? Well, it turns out getting 3 bodies on board, two of which have Divine Shield, and in essence having 4 top minions your opponent needs to attack through, plus having some mech synergies here and there makes for way too strong of a card. The card would show up in just about everything due to how versatile it was and how much it did for its low cost. Murloc Paladin? Yeah, it's in there. Token Druid? Of course. This bowl of Minestrone? A staple. It became so popular, decks started running Blood Knight to deal with all these divine shields. Blood Knight. And of course, on top of it being good in everything, it became superb in Quest Rogue. The card was a defensive presence of Wax Elemental combined with the multiple bodies from Vile Fin Tide Hunter rolled into one. And with slow druids taking over the format in the form of Malagos Druid and Togwaggle Druid, Quest Rogue was tier 1 again. As these decks whittled away with their multi-card combos, Rogue again established itself as a high ladder, high skill deck that crushes all slow decks that oppose it. While Quest Rogue struggled against the emerging token druid deck, its ability to counteract those slower druid and warlock decks kept it viable. But now, it was time to put Quest Rogue to the test again as it was time for the Hearthstone Championship Door Fall Playoffs. In the Americas Playoff, 33 of the 77 participants brought the deck, making it the second most popular deck, behind 39 players bringing even Warlock. At the EU Playoffs, we see 30 of the 87 players bringing Quest Rogue. The deck at the time looked like this, mostly what we had been seeing since the beginning but with Valir the Hollow, 2 Vicious Scalehide, 1 to 2 Elven Minstrel, 2 Giggling Inventor, and Zola as the main addition since the deck's original release. Perhaps the most interesting development is that the deck had mostly moved away from Firefly and Igneous Elemental in order to get the room to fit in these new defensive options, and the one drop space of Firefly had been almost completely overtaken by Wax Elemental. Cutting Firefly was an attempt to further improve the control matchup, again at the cost of the aggro matchup. On the latter, the deck makes some changes such as swapping out two Wax Elementals for two Phantom Knives to deal with Token Druid's Wisps, and then, a year and a half after its initial release, after being nerfed directly twice, Quest Rogue took Tempo Storm's number one spot in the meta. Four expansions had come out since Dog first got rank 1 legend with the deck and now we see Fino, Gyong, and Rage all hit rank 1 legend with the deck over the course of two weeks. At this point, people have gotten plenty sick of the obscenely polarized matchups of the deck. Queuing into Crest Rogue with the right deck, like Aluneth Mage, means a 90% chance of winning, and most likely an early concession by the opponent. Queuing into Quest Rogue with Odd Warrior means a 10% chance of winning, and probably concession by you as soon as turn 1. Well, with patch 12.2.0.27358 on October 18th, 2018, Giggling Inventor gets nerfed to 7 mana, and is now nowhere near as good. While Gingling Adventure was a big loss for the deck, the deck's biggest obstacle, Tempo Mage, had had its mana worm downgraded to 2 mana, and even without Gingling Adventure, the deck can still crush slow strategies, meaning the deck can continue on in a less popular, more like tier 2 state as the Boomsday Project winds down. Now, with the launch of the new expansion, Rotsukhan's Rumble, and no cards in the set looking like they would benefit Quest Rogue, maybe now it is finally time for the deck to be put to pasture. Except, Rastakhan's Rumble ended up being so weak of an expansion that Gyeong immediately shoots to number one legend running the deck with absolutely no new cards. In fact, aside from one lab recruiter, the deck doesn't include any Boomsday cards either. Taking it a step further, outside of two Vicious Scalehide, 
the deck doesn't play any Witchwood cards either, which means outside of these three cards, the deck is identical to versions that would be played when Cobalt and Catacombs released one year earlier. We now see the slow downturn of the deck appearing in only six lineups of the 76 in HCT America, but Group B winner Bloody Face was one of those six alongside Group A runner-up Bobby X. In Europe, the deck was brought by only four of the 80 participants. The deck was slightly more popular in Asia Pacific where it was brought by 16 of the 79 participants including a top four finish. Well, the deck had one more big tournament before it was going to rotate out of the standard format. The Hearthstone Winter Championship 2019 Quarter Million Dollar Prize Pool $50,000 for first place. Six players bring the deck. In the finals, it's Roger with the deck versus Bunny Hopper without. And we see and I don't that think is insane. Unless Roger has like a like a tidal wave or like a meteor strike his side of the stage right now, there is no way he's losing this one. That is nuts. We said it. He was an overwhelming underdog in that series. Coming into a match where Bunny Hopper had three aggressive decks against his three anti control decks and somehow pulls out a 3 0 over Bunny Hopper to win the finals and become the winner champion. One last ride for the Cowboy. And then the year of the Mammoth rotated out of standard, finally ending the deck. Thanks everyone for watching. A little different style of video today. Let me know what you think of it. Please subscribe to my YouTube as well as check me out on Twitter at Mr. Chundo and TikTok at Chundo TikTok. Thanks.